Martin, since you're not presenting on this one, I'm going to bump you down to just a, a attendee. Okay. All right. Um, welcome everybody to day two of CrimCon um, and our 12 p.m. Eastern panel uh, issues, issues concerning corrections, easy for me to say. Um, we have four papers being presented today. Um, so uh, I've already talked to our panelists. We'll be following the 10 minute time limit um, pretty strictly here just to give everybody equal opportunities to talk and then we will save all questions for the end. Um, if you have any questions for any of our panelists, please um, post them in the Q&A box at the bottom of your screen. Um, and we will address all of those at the end. Um, we'll go in the order of the program and I will uh, do my best to jump in with about a minute left. Uh, I always feel guilty doing it. I think I'm disrupting your flow, but um, I'm not doing it to be rude or disruptive or anything, but I guess I kind of am <laughs> just to make sure we stay on time. So apologies in advance for that. Um, so none of you came here to listen to me talk. So our first paper today is the effects of prison, prison animal programs on the pains of imprisonment. Um, Barbara, um, please, Barbara, let's take it away whenever you're ready. All right. All right. Thank you all for joining us. Uh, my co-author and I, Leslie Hill and uh, our, the title of our page that we added this little bit part, uh, a little bit of laughter in a dark place. So looking at uh, our harsh prison environments doing more harm than good. So as early all the way back to 1842, Charles Dickens rebuked the Eastern Penitentiary of Pennsylvania, noting the anguish and hopelessness of the inmates and characterizing them as men buried alive dead to everything but the torturing anxieties and horrible despair. And since then, researchers have begun to explore ways to improve prison conditions by reducing the pains and strains of imprisonment with the objective of reducing both disciplinary infractions and recidivism. And there is indeed a small but growing body of literature that indicates that when prison conditions are both improved, are improved both disciplinary infractions and recidivism decrease. And other researchers have found it, uh, have focused on prison conditions and used general strain theory as a guide, reasoning that strains caused by conditions and events found in a prison can increase the likelihood of crime. All right. So um, can prison animal programs actually reduce these pains and strains of imprisonment? So uh, prison animal programs are one type of program that have uh, considerable promise to reduce the pains and strains of imprisonment, as demonstrated by recent literature. Um, animals uh, have been used in rehabilitation since the late 1700s and can by combining the rehabilitative effects of animals with a structured training program, um, often in community service model, it is conceivable that programs such as these could improve prison conditions by easing some of the pains and strains of imprisonment. Indeed, uh, my own article with David Farrington found support for the notion that these prisons reduce the pains of imprisonment for female offenders. We noted that working with animals in incarcerating settings is one of the most highly sought after positions and is often viewed positively with a goal as, as a valued goal in an institution. We also found that liberty and autonomy are some of the most common positively valued stimuli that are reduced in institutions. However, being a participant in a dog training program uh, does appear to give you back some of those uh, elements of liberty and autonomy. And uh, lastly, in these programs, uh, you are required to have custody levels that allow you to live in certain units that are notoriously safer and increase senses of security. And it's often perceived as a valuable stimuli in an institution. Of, um, and uh, to quote uh, our own article, we indicated that dog training programs also cr often create an oasis of security within a volatile prison. So uh, this was, these were two separate projects that Barbara and I did separately, um, but upon comparing our results, they were very similar. So both of us did qualitative group interviews, um, open-ended questions, similar topics. I talked to 127 inmates at Florida, South Carolina Department of Corrections prisons. 
Uh, three were male institutions and one was a female institution. I had three medium security and one maximum security prison. And my, uh, my group looked at uh, dog programs, cat, uh, cat programs, horse, cattle, and beekeeping while Dr. Cook so mine were, uh, so this is an expansion on a previous study, and I was in four uh, Florida, or sorry, three Florida Department of Corrections work camps, so those are medium, medium and minimum security facilities, and I interviewed in, um, in group interviews and individual interviews 19 male inmates who are all dog training program participants. So when we uh, compared results, we identified three themes that stuck out and we're gonna talk about each one. So starting with improved relationships with correctional staff, that was a big finding. Um, so the uh, inmates identified several reasons why they thought their relationships improved. The first is that they eased tension for everyone, um, that the animals bridged the gap between the inmates and the correctional officers. The inmates indicated that many of the COs were quite antisocial until they saw the animals. Some of the inmates I interviewed noted that even the harshest COs mellowed out in the presence of the animals and that one of the officers that they considered the worst now jokes around with them. Um, the inmates felt that the COs respected them and the work that they, they did with the animals, which in turn gave them incentive to show respect towards the COs. Um, and inmates from all three dog training programs noted that the handlers became intuitive of the COs that didn't like the dogs and then kept them away from those COs, uh, which improved the relationship between the two. Uh, the third reason they felt that their relationship improved was that the COs or correctional staff started to trust their skills. Inmates from all dog programs indicated that they trusted their skills so much that they often asked for advice with their own dogs. Uh, one guy in a dog training program said the warden even called him to his office and he was nervous the whole way there until the warden was just asking him for advice about how to get the, his own dog from jumping uh, on him. The inmates in the beekeeping program were really proud to say that um, when a colony splits and a swarm happens somewhere else that the correctional officers and staff uh, trusted them to move the swarm back, which is something that you usually have to call a professional to do. And um, Dr. Cook and I were also struck by how surprised the inmates were that the officers trusted them. For instance, one inmate told me that it was the first time in 30 years he's had an officer trust him, while an inmate told Dr. Cook that the officer who doesn't like anything was starting to trust him. Um, but the most common statement that both of us heard was that the animal programs helped to change the CO's view of the inmates, allowing them to get to know them as humans and not just an inmate. The second uh, thing that we found was a reduction in stress. So it was regardless of what animal program, they all said it reduced their stress. Uh, those in the beekeeping program said the bees calmed and relaxed them. One inmate said working with the bees feels like freedom. Another inmate remarked that um, the inmates working with the animals were calmer and that you're a product of your own environment. Those in the cat program said that the cats relieved stress and they said it, it allowed for a little bit of laughter in a dark place. And all of the dog program participants were called situations where dogs diffuse tense situations. Dr. Cook and I heard too many stories like this to recount today. They all kind of sounded similar. Two inmates were arguing. It looked like it was gonna escalate until a dog walked over and either nuzzled the hand of the aggressor or laid their head on the person's feet and the fights would abruptly stop. Um, at the female institution, the inmates told me a story of a woman in a mental health crisis who was banging her head against the wall until a dog came over and calmed her right down. The last finding that we had um, was that the inmates in the animal program noted that there were hardly any fights. In fact, they joked that the dogs fight more than they did. Um, they said that they felt much safer and they didn't need to watch their backs like they do in other prison yards. They even went as far to say that they felt that this program can remove violence from other prison yards. Most of the inmates attributed the reduction in fights to one of four things. The first of which is that the animals relax the inmates. They explain that spending time with the animals brings out the compassion in all of them, leading to a more relaxed and calm inmate who is less likely to argue or fight with someone. One inmate said everything is so much easier with an animal around. The second reason is that it, they said it brought the inmates together. Um, the inmate said the entire yard changed when the dogs came in. People that normally kept to themselves were reaching out. And they explained that many of the inmates that had been incarcerated for 20 to 30 years um, and were now interacting with dogs, they said that the dogs softened the men who had been hardened by prison uh, in prison over the decades. 
The third reason was that the animals allowed them to occupy their time and their mind. Those in the thoroughbred retirement program explained that after a long day of working with the horses, they were too tired to get into trouble. Those in the dog program said the animals gave them something to do and there was less time to think about a typical prison scheme um, or get into a situation where it's likely that a verbal or physical altercation would happen. Several of the inmates ruminated about their time in maximum security prisons and agreed that the current environment was very different. Um, it said, they said you adapt to the environment that you're in. The last thing that they noted was that this program um, was motivation for them to behave. Um, inmates from all institutions independently said they wouldn't get into fights because they didn't want to get kicked out of the program. Um, several inmates said being in the program made them think twice about with whom they interacted. They said they went straight to their bed after the day and didn't stop to mingle or talk to the troublemakers. They wanted to avoid the temptation to get involved or get dragged into a situation that could get them kicked out. They were very clear to explain that in prison, the code of conduct says that if someone starts a fight, you're expected to finish it so that you don't look like a target. So their solution was to stay away from the troublemakers at all. Um, similarly, the inmates in all the dog programs independently discussed situations where they would regularly bite their tongue to avoid getting into a fight. Again, they all stress this is highly abnormal behavior because usually in, when an inmate disrespects you publicly, the customary response is to start a fight um, so you don't get labeled as weak. But they said for these specific instances, it just wasn't worth it to get kicked out of the animal program. About one minute left. Perfect. So what are the implications of this? So uh, prisons have a great deal. I love this quote by from Ta Hans talk about altruism programs in prison, which many of these programs um, arguably are uh, forms of. So prisons have a great deal to gain and a little to, and little to lose in multiplying the opportunities for inmates to get engage in altruistic activities that add a humane human face or humane face to corrections. So there's a growing body of evidence that uh, dog training programs are cost effective and um, uh, effective in desirable outcomes, including uh, internalizing and externalizing uh, ones. We have an article coming out in March that outlines that in more detail. Um, these do appear to mitigate some of the criminogenic mechanisms of imprisonment. We were only able, because of time, to highlight a few of our findings, but we hope to expand on this. And generally, it shows that it's improving the quality of life for offenders, which, as discussed uh, before in the literature review, leads to reductions in disciplinary infractions and recidivism. And of course, these our programs are often described as a win-win because they improve, they provide valuable services to the community, and they improve they improve community relations because of that, and they appear to have uh, very positive, uh, desirable outcomes on both the uh, participants in the program, but as we're showing even here, on the correctional institutions themselves. And that is it. Thank you. Thank you. Um, there you go. Our next paper is the application of risk assessments to correctional practice. Um, whenever you're ready. Oh, go. There you go. Hi, thank you. Hi, uh, my name is Kelly Freeman. Um, I'm joined by my colleagues, Lily, Libby Doyle and Lily Robin. Uh, a little bit of tongue twister there, sorry about that. Uh, but we're researchers at the Urban Institute. Uh, it's a nonprofit um, research organization located in Washington, DC. And we're here to share some findings from a qualitative component of a project that we're working on currently uh, that focuses on developing sex offense specific risk assessment tools for both institutional and community correction settings. And so I will be sharing just a little bit of an introduction about that project um, and the work that we were doing and before passing it over to my colleagues. Uh, through our work with several um, uh, departments of corrections in the United States, we completed extensive interviews with correctional leaders and key stakeholders to both document existing practices around risk assessment, uh, as well as understand sort of what types of items would be necessary to include in a locally developed risk assessment tool. Um, and so we, our focus was really interviewing them on their practice around um, risk assessment for both general population, as well as for those who have a history of sexual offending um, and how those might differ or overlap. Uh, and so our case flow mapping process was done in part, again, like I said, to norm the local risk tool, um, but also to identify uh, where to implement a risk assessment tool um, in their existing practices. And you know, implementation can be an often overlooked piece of risk assessment development. Uh, and so we, I think, wanted to 
get the buy-in of the um, uh, practitioners at the Department of Corrections to understand what the need is, how we could kind of fill that gap uh, with the locally developed tool. Um, and specifically with regards to sexual offending, um, there are state policies that um, kind of, you know, impact decision making for people who have a history of sex offending um, that would have clear implications for a risk assessment tool. And so that's something that we wanted to make sure we were um, aware of and cognizant of in terms of developing a tool. And so though, though there are um, risk assessment tools in practice, uh, especially in terms of sexual offending, those tools were not necessarily developed, again, for the states that they're being used in, um, for the same populations, uh, or for the same kind of policy context. Uh, and so some of the common ones that are in use um, the most common one is the static suite of risk assessment tools, including the static 99. There's also the stable um, MinSoft, SORAG, and others that are used. So um, what we have learned actually through our interviews and through our case uh, flow process mapping, I guess I could call it, um, was that there's a good deal of variation in whether a tool is used at all for um, making assessments of um, recidivism in terms of sexual offending. Um, and if it was used at what stage of decision-making it's used at, if it's used at prison intake or only for community settings. Um, and also we've learned that sometimes multiple tools are actually used. Um, and those could be multiple tools that are specific to sexual offending. So um, they have very different ways that they have to you know, sort of combine the responses or understand, interpret the risk scores across these different risk tools. So with all that sort of background, I'm not gonna pass it over to Libby to share some insights from our process mapping, actually look at um, two states in particular, uh, and then Lily will describe some of the challenges for both uh, researchers and state correctional leaders to consider. Libby? Yeah, so as Kelly um, indicated, one of the big parts of our study was to kind of look at where in the process states are utilizing these sex offense specific risk assessment tools. So. Um, this is just one example from one of the states that we interviewed. Um, this example process map is from a state in our study that um, illustrates a system in which sex offense risk assessment tools are utilized in a prison setting to determine treatment. Um, so the highlighted areas of this process map indicate where the risk assessment tools are being used on the sex offender specific population. So in this specific state, risk measures from the static 99 are first provided to the Board of Probations and Parole. Um, prior to an individual's hearing. And then if this individual is ultimately recommended for sex offense treatment, they are reassessed using several tools, um, including the static 99 and stable during a pretreatment period of about 26 weeks. Um, and then following their discharge from the treatment program itself, um, instruments are updated and they can also be updated in this state um, if a person has a hearing coming up with the Board of Probations and Parole. And then at the bottom, you also see that community corrections also utilizes risk assessment tools to help determine level of supervision. However, um, sex offenders are usually typically um, overridden to high for their first year, regardless of the outcome of these um, risk assessment tools. So in our study, we also saw states using these tools at intake um, or for specific purposes, such as eligibility for work release in the institutional correction setting. And then this slide shows um, what, what a state process map looks like when they don't when a state doesn't utilize it within the prison setting, but rather just at the community supervision stage. Um, again, the highlighted text illustrates where risk assessment tools are used on the sex offender population. Um, so this particular state that we looked at doesn't have a sex offense specific um, treatment during incarceration. So, um, but the community corrections agency does utilize sex offense risk assessment tools to both determine supervision levels, which similar to the previous state, um, sex offenders are overridden to either moderate or high supervision during release. So these, these tools can help determine those two, between those two levels. Um, and tool scores are also used to determine whether an individual is required to enroll in treatment in the community. So between these two process maps, they really illustrate um, how states can use these tools at different junctures in the criminal justice system for different decision-making points and kind of what that impact does have on the population. And then I'm gonna pass it off to Lily to kind of talk about some of the implications and takeaways from this. So in addition, oh, sorry, <coughs> me. Um, so 
There's a lot of barriers and considerations that agencies and researchers might want to consider when implementing these tools. Um, some of them you can kind of see through those process maps that Libby went through. Um, so one of them is that there's tools that are administered and there's tools that are automated. So an automated tool is really limited by what data an agency has already available, but it can be less resource in intensive if technical capabilities already exist to automate that tool in their computer system. Um, so on the flip side, a tool that's administered opens the door for a lot more creativity and options and metrics that you want to consider, but it can be more research and resource intensive because it relies on um, having someone administer the tool and you have to think about who, when, and how to administer it, what qualifications they have. And that leads into the next barriers and considerations, which is training. So if you're having someone administer the tool, oftentimes you're going to have to have a training when you first provide the tool and also <clears throat> I'm sorry my voice is probably really annoying right now um, when you first provide the tool and also um, a training tra just trainings throughout time as their staff turnover and to remind people refresh on how to use the tool um, in addition to that training what even if you're automating a tool you'd still want to make sure that you're training staff on um, how to interpret the tool what decisions it dictates things like that when it is and isn't okay to override and automate um, the tools risk score um, and all that training can also help a lot with staff buy-in and staff buy-in is another really big consideration of implementing these tools um, and as you probably noticed in the process maps that Libby was sharing there's some agencies that use several different tools and if that's the case then it's very important to think about how each different tool is used, how they fit together, and what happens if the risk scores that different tools spit out contradict each other. Um, so one of the examples Libby shared had um, three different sex offense tool, uh, sex, sex offense risk assessment, or sex, yeah, sex offense risk assessment tools that were used. And I recall when we were talking to the agency that they said like, well, this one's better for getting an idea of like how someone might do in programming, but this one's better for like risk of recidivism generally. About one minute um, left. Okay, perfect. And then um, my colleague Kelly in her introduction touched a little bit on state policies. Um, that's an important consideration. So for example, um, some states actually have statutes that say that anyone that has a history of sex offense can't be on a low supervision level. So if you're in an agency, in a, if you're in a state that has that law, it might not be helpful to have a tool that informs supervision level for individuals with a history of sex offense because you don't actually necessarily have a choice on that, unfortunately. Um, and then the last consideration is validation. Validation is super important. Um, it can be really enticing to grab a tool off the shelf that's already made, like the static. Um, it's, it is validated, but it might not be validated on a population that looks like the population that you're interested in using the tool for. Um, so for instance, I think the static was validated on a population in Canada. Um, and that might not be the same as like a population in Georgia, for instance, or honestly, anywhere in the United States. Um, so that is, um, and local validation can be a little tricky. Um, you can have subpopulations that you want to make sure that a tool is working for so that there aren't racial disparities. And if that's a small part of your population, it can be really hard, but it's super important. Um, so yeah, that's just a list of some of our uh, considerations, barriers, yeah. <laughs> Fantastic, thank you so much. Um, our next paper, um, examining the relationship between property crime rates and halfway houses in Vancouver, British Columbia. Um, Jeremy, whenever you're ready, um, the floor is yours. Uh, thanks so much. Um, so my name is Jeremy and I'm an MA student at Simon Fraser University's School of Criminology. And uh, today I'll be presenting some findings from a draft of my thesis on the relationship between property crime rates and halfway houses in Vancouver, BC. Um, so in many jurisdictions, halfway houses are, are an essential component of the practice of gradual and supervised release of offenders from an institution. However, uh, community opposition to halfway houses tends to contribute to their placement in criminogenic neighborhoods that exacerbates the risk of recidivism. Uh, any observations that crime is higher in these neighborhoods can be spuriously attributed to the halfway houses themselves, which in turn reinforces that opposition. So my question is, 
uh, whether an area's proximity to halfway houses is associated with its rates of different property crimes. And my project is done entirely with open source data, which for my study area of Vancouver means that um, only property crime can be analyzed, but this still yields uh, important insight into how halfway houses factor into um, neighborhood crime. Um, using the language from crime pattern theory, we would expect halfway houses to function as crime generators or attractors. In addition to functioning as uh, home nodes for large volumes of offenders, these facilities attract other offenders for a variety of reasons who may visit the area to associate with their newly released peers, consider residents targets for potential offending, or may simply attend a halfway house during the day in fulfillment of their conditions of release. Uh, even if recidivism rates are low, it still has an additive effect on crime in the community. At the same time though, halfway houses may cause other changes to surrounding neighborhoods that have implications for crime. The placement of halfway houses, for example, may displace routine activities of potential victims away from the surrounding area, reducing the availability of targets. Uh, greater guardianship uh, may also, um, sorry, greater guardianship provided by halfway house staff Corrections uh, personnel and local law enforcement may also reduce the risk of crime. Looking to the empirical literature, uh, studies of the effects of halfway houses are primarily isolated to the recidivism outcome rather than crime itself. The few studies that do analyze the relationship uh, with crime yield mixed results. Hai and Han, for example, found increases in crime surrounding halfway houses after their placement and reductions in crime after they closed down. Groff and Lockwood study in Philadelphia found that halfway houses were positively associated with disorder crime in uh, 800 and 1200 foot buffers, um, but they also found that violent crime decreased within 1200 feet of halfway houses and were not significantly associated at all with halfway houses within 400 and 800 feet. For property crime, which is uh, the interest of uh, my thesis, Groff and Lockwood found a significant reduction within 800 and 1200 feet. And uh, this is the only study so far that I've seen looking explicitly at the relationship between halfway houses and property crime. Uh, McCord and Radcliffe though found uh, around, sorry, they found uh, disproportionately high levels of uh, drug crime around halfway houses, which is itself associated with many other forms of offending, including property crime. Um, so we're very much all over the map in terms of positive findings, negative findings, and null findings. The studies on the association between halfway houses and recidivism over the last 15 years are a little more consistent. Overall, correctional halfway houses are associated with a slightly uh, reduced risk of recidivism and longer time spent in the community prior to recidivism. However, the net result of this in terms of crime in the community is not consistently observed and may depend uh, at least in part on geography. Jumping into what I've done, my study area is the city of Vancouver, British Columbia. Um, all the data that I use is cross-sectional from 2016. And as of 2016, Vancouver had a population of 631,486 spread across 993 dissemination areas. There are six halfway houses within Vancouver um, within five DAs, which I've highlighted in the core left map on the right. Um, and these six halfway houses contain uh, a total of 136 beds. Uh, 78 of those 136 beds belong to the two northerly halfway houses. Of these two, one of them, uh, which is the most populous, is located in the downtown east side, which is a neighborhood in Vancouver known for its extreme concentration of crime, drug addiction, severe mental illness, and homelessness. The other of the two is in the central business district, which is saturated with opportunities for property offenses and also adjacent to the downtown east side. Um, proximity to halfway houses for each dissemination area is measured using the sum of inverse square distances to halfway houses within the 3.62 kilometer radius of their centroids. 3.62 kilometers uh, or 2.2 miles uh, is admittedly a large buffer, but I think it represents a reasonable sphere of influence um, since it is the furthest distance between any two halfway houses. And as I mentioned um, earlier, uh, offenders may travel to and from other halfway houses um, uh, on foot actually, which is quite common. Um, a second measure of inverse square distance is computed, which uh, adjusts the original measure to account for the number of beds at each facility, which ranges from eight to 48. And both measures are standardized out of 100 to be more comparable. Moving on to my dependent variables, the five crime types analyzed here are residential and commercial break and enter, theft of auto, theft from auto, and other theft. And to, uh, to compute these rates, uh, the denominators uh, Denominators other than residential population are used, and those that are chosen are considered more theoretically meaningful representations of population at risk. So for um, residential break and enter, the number of dwellings is used. Uh, the number of 
licensed non-residential businesses is used for commercial break and enter, um, and an estimate of the ambient population based on Oak Ridge National Laboratory's LandScan Global Population Database is used for uh, all three types of theft. Uh, each rate represents the number of crimes per 1,000 population at risk, which is logged to reduce the possibility of outliers. As controls, I've incorporated 10 variables that represent social disorganization, incivilities, and convergences of motivated offenders and suitable targets in the absence of capable guardianship pursuant to routine activity theory, and 16 more control variables that represent criminogenic places and land uses informed by research on crime pattern theory. And I can go into those in more detail later if anyone has questions. Um, so to reiterate, the research question is whether dissemination areas, rates of property crime are related to their pro um, proximity to halfway houses. And this is addressed in two parts. Uh, first, Spearman's correlations are conducted to answer this question at the bivariate level. So do we see at least superficially an increase or decrease in the logged crime rates as a DA's exposure to halfway houses increases? Second, if there is a relationship, uh, does this hold after controlling for various environmental risk factors? Due to spatial uh, dependence on the data, this second part is addressed by estimating uh, spatial lag models using two stage least squares regression complemented by um, an impacts analysis showing the direct and indirect effects of proximity to halfway houses after considering spillovers of crime from the autoregressive process. Um, so at the bivariate level, all large crime rates are significantly associated with uh, proximity to halfway houses with p-values all less than 0.001. Um, interestingly, the rate of uh, the log rate of residential break and enter is uh, negatively associated with the proximity of halfway houses, but this could be an artifact of the concentration of apartment high rises um, in the central business district and uh, um, surrounding areas, which are harder to break into and have, generally speaking, a higher security presence. The remaining four crime types are positively associated with uh, proximity to halfway houses. Um, with coefficients ranging from 0.1, if we're, sorry, if we're looking at the inverse square distance row, uh, coefficients ranging from 0.198 for uh, theft of auto to 0.378 for other theft. And these relationships are overall fairly weak, but still significant, which is in line with the expectation that halfway houses um, may be crime generators or attractors. And the Spearman's correlations are strengthened substantially for all crime types when the weighted measure is used, suggesting that the uh, number of offenders residing at each facility does play a role. Once we actually control for um, various environmental risk factors though, um, what we actually see is that uh, theft from auto is the only logged crime rate significantly associated with the proximity to halfway houses at the 0 0.05 level. Um, furthermore, while we, uh, oh, sorry, while it, um, in the bivariate relationships, we saw that uh, the strength of association was increased for the weighted measure. Um, we have very similar coefficients for both uh, the sum of inverse square distances and the weighted sum, suggesting that the number of offenders do not actually play as large a role as initially expected. Um, and this speaks more to halfway houses as attractors of crime rather than generators. Um, looking at the impacts analysis uh, under the Corpleth map, after okay, considering one minute left. Thank you. Um, looking at the uh, uh, sorry, after considering the effects of an increase in theft from. Uh, auto in one DA spilling over into surrounding DAs and then back onto itself. One unit increases in um, uh, ISD and WISD are associated with roughly 0 0.02 increase in the log rates of theft from auto um, in those DAs. Um, so although the relationship is significant with p-values of less than 0 0.01, the spatial pseudo R square increases only by 0 0.004 or 0.005 from the control models to the IS, um, ISD and WISD models respectively. So proximity to halfway houses can, um, only offers a, a small contribution to our understanding of this particular um, crime pattern. So in conclusion, uh, despite significant relationships with all logged crime rates detected at the bivariate level, after controlling for a number of environmental risk factors, the proximity to halfway houses is not significantly associated with four of the five logged crime rates. Theft from auto is the only crime type significantly associated uh, with, this, um, with this variable. Um, and uh, findings are no different after adjusting uh, the proximity of halfway houses to account for the capacity of each facility. And this is consistent with the idea that these facilities themselves exert an influence on the local neighborhoods that cannot be attributed to the offenders themselves. Any increases in crime uh, may therefore be balanced out by local increases in guardianship and the displacement of routine activities of potential victims. Thank you. Thank you. Um, our final paper today 
um, the value of life and risk exposure decisions. Um, Taryn, whenever you're ready. There you go. Great. Hello, I am Dr. Taryn Vanderpile with Western Oregon University in the Criminal Justice Sciences Division. And I want to talk to you today about value of life in terms of risk exposure decisions in a specific prison labor program. So long story, very short, I became interested in this prison labor program for inmate firefighters. And when I looked them up, I saw this quote on their homepage. So one of South Fork's major purposes is to supply a ready workforce to combat firefighters or <laughs> to combat forest or wildfires throughout the state. A recent example, actually not that recent anymore, was this big complex fire in 1996. The US Department of Forestry called in two hotshot firefighting teams to work this 450 acre fire in an area of concern. The hotshots, who are the best of the best, mind you, the hotshots refused to fight the fire due to its dangerous location. Consequently, the US Forestry Department, which generally does not utilize Oregon Department of Forestry crews, contacted South Fork, which promptly dispatched six inmate fire crews to the scene. So it was too dangerous for the hotshot crews. So they said, let's send in these inmate fire crews instead. These six crews tackled the fire within a week, brought it under control. They did a wonderful job, which is the point of having this on their website. And because this went so well, this specific incident has caused the agencies to take a new look at South Fork as an initial attack group. So now they're saying, let's send the inmates in first and not worry so much about the danger. So um, I saw this as a value of life decision and that naturally concerned me. Uh, this is also especially relevant in 2020. Think about all the wildfires we have. And did you hear about the great work that inmate firefighters were doing? Uh, my guess is, is you did not. Some reasons this is especially concerning is that there are constitutional requirements, both federally and in, in at least the Oregon state constitution, that inmates must work. Uh, there are also Supreme Court decisions and court decisions at every level, in fact, determining that inmates are not employees. So that means they're not protected by OSHA or any other employee rights. So that means people are put in dangerous situations with no choice and no due process. So I was trying to figure out why we, the collective we, why we accept this. Uh, and I was looking at different frameworks to get a better understanding. Uh, there's deservedness, but that focuses on, on rewards like welfare and affirmative action. So it's saying, are the people who benefit from welfare and affirmative action really deserving of that. There's also belief in a just world, but that focuses on bad things happening to bad people, not when someone makes a bad thing happen because they don't think that person is worth as much as them. And finally, I looked at punishment theory, but that doesn't cover choosing to put someone at risk as part of that punishment. So none of these capture that subjective value of life decision in regard to putting someone else's life at risk because it's not worth as much as another. And when you add a focus on allowable, acceptable risk, those are value of life decisions. So you can see it here in this diagram. If you look at the first pyramid there, you've got incarcerated workers, these adults in custody at the forest work camp. Above them then in this, this pyramid would be non-incarcerated workers like professional firefighters. And above them are the authority figures, the folks who make the decisions about who does what kind of work. And as you go up this pyramid, the social and professional status increases. As you go down the pyramid, the relative value of life compared to those above them decreases. And as the relative value of life decreases, that level of risk deemed acceptable increases. So all of this was concerning to me. And I wanted to go talk to the guys who are incarcerated in this prison labor camp and get their perspective. 
So I went there and I interviewed 21 of the guys. Um, the facility houses 220 men when it's full. So I got to talk to about 10% of the population through this really fascinating snowball sampling that I don't have time to tell you about. Um, I went there and asked these really open-ended questions. And I was just trying to uh, find out more about the labor program in general. And it was through grounded theory that these main themes were identified and have led to three major offshoots of this project, one of which we're talking about in this presentation. So they talked about dignity versus shame. Um, they talked about value of life and safety, which we're talking about today. And they also talked about exploitation versus rehabilitation, which is a, fut um, a future project. So for the sake of, of this part of it, the research question ended up being, how do AICs, these ad adults in custody, discuss their experiences in this prison labor program regarding safety, training, injuries, and equipment? So from their, from their quotes, um, they actually covered all these different areas that are addressed for wildland firefighting in the OSHA requirements, the safe and healthy, or safety and health requirements for the state. Um, I don't have time to go through all of these with you, of course, so I'm just gonna share a few of these with you for the sake of time. The first one is on footwear. So there's a requirement that wildland fire fighters are provided with secure footing and traction for the assigned task. One of the AICs shared, a lot of the gear is pretty great. It would be nice to get caulk boots, which are boots with little spikes, like little spikes on the end of them, because when it gets wet, the sticks are really slick, but they won't provide them for us and they won't let us try to buy them. That's kind of an important safety gear that we're not allowed to have for some reason. They don't want us to have metal spikes on our boots, but they let us have chainsaws. Another area is fall protection. So you can see here that each employee on a walking working surface with an unprotected side or edge that's four feet or more above the lower level should be protected from falling by a guardrail system, a safety net system, or some kind of harness, but they don't have any of those. So a couple AICs discussed that. Uh, one shared I fell off a 30 foot cliff, caught myself, slid the rest of the way down the mountain and then finished my job. And I was running saw. So I had a chainsaw in my hand the whole time this happened. Another man shared, we work with chainsaws all the time and we're falling trees and it's just, it's dangerous. We're working on cliffs, especially out in the fires. And one final area I will share with you is specific to those chainsaws. So chainsaws, are not supposed to use if they're in any way defective. Uh, chainsaws must have an operable chain break and they must be operational at all times. One AIC shared though, for like a week and a half, I had a chainsaw that the chain break didn't work. That's a little plastic thing on the front that will drop down and it stops the chainsaw from running. So if it kicks back at you, it won't chop into your face. My boss's boss said, well, just keep using it. We'll figure it out. So, there's some conclusions and theoretical implications that can be drawn from this study. Um, and I could go on and on about this, but not within a 10 minute <laughs> window. So some of those are that we need to recognize that these decisions are subjective and hierarchical and these are value of life decisions that are being made. And value of life should be explored in other areas. We see examples of this in many areas of life and we need to address it for what it is. And finally, there is much more work to be done to explore and address prison labor as involuntary servitude, which I continue to do. So my contact information is on this last slide here. I'm happy to answer any questions or to, just to continue the conversation. So please, please reach out if you're interested. Thank you. Thank you, Taryn. Thank you all of our, all of our presenters this morning. Um, so we have some time. I have a few minutes for questions. Um, there was one that came in that uh, the folks at the Urban Institute have already um, answered, but I, I want to, for just for the sake of our audience, um, to give them a, a chance to hear it as well. And if, and if any of you want to um, follow through or follow up on anything that, that was in the answer, 
um, please feel free to do so. Um, so the question was, um, the second presenters touched briefly on the importance of validating tools with various groups, but could you talk more about whether there's evidence that risk assessment tools perpetuate racial disparities by relying on items that are racialized? Uh, for example, will people disproportionately impacted by policing automatically score higher, score as higher risk because they are more likely to have a criminal history? Are there other variables that covertly serve as proxy for race? Um, this is a really important question. And so I, I didn't want this um, to just be kept within the panelists. Um, so if anyone wants to comment um, from the Urban Institute, um, please do so. Um, Kelly, do you wanna summarize what you wrote and I'll touch on a few other points? Yeah, I was just gonna say, I think the, um, the main thing that I was just kind of touching the surface of was um, how to measure fairness, I think. Um, the point being that we do, we do see differences in subgroups in terms of um, the risk level, um, as well as whether or not a tool um, performs as well uh, across different groups. And so seeing those differences, um, and I know ProPublica had a piece as well talking about machine bias and seeing that there's difference in error rates as well. So um, somebody who's labeled high risk, um, who is black might actually not go onto a fend where at, at a higher rate versus somebody who's white, um, who label low risk might actually go on to, to um, offend or be more likely to offend uh, later on. So there's all sorts of ways of looking at what fairness is. And I think that's basically what I was trying to get at. And so it really depends on how you're measuring it. Um, and I know Lily has some examples. So maybe she could talk more about like even looking at like the AUC in particular, the area under the rock curve, which is commonly used in risk assessment validation. But the, the main point is um, you really should be, I guess, working with local agencies in order to assess and understand where um, bias can come in, uh, in terms of the items that are included, looking at base rates um, of just justice involvement. Um, I don't like to refer to sort of like arrest as um, just a measure of offending. So just like somebody's level of involvement in the justice system is really what we're measuring with risk assessment tools. So those are kind of the, I guess, two points that I would make is just how we're measuring it, what people are looking at when they're developing the tool, and then also focusing on um, what the measurement actually is of. It's not necessarily um, offending behavior or at least solely offending behavior. It's also just justice system contact. Um, so I uh, would definitely just uh, tacking onto that, um, when you're designing and implementing the tool, those are some like really important considerations. Um, I'm not gonna go into detail on like how there is bias throughout the entire criminal justice system. I'm sure you're all aware of that. Um, but when you design the tool, you can think about what metrics you put into the tool. Um, not everything, like you don't even have to put criminal history in. So there's some tools, a lot of tools do include criminal history, um, but they'll also include other metrics that maybe moving forward might be more important to consider. So for instance, there's a sex offense tool that looks more at the context of a crime as opposed to whether or not and how many crimes happen. So um, was a stranger and was the victim a stranger? Um, did it happen in public or private? And these are um, different characteristics of sex offending crimes that are actually related to recidivism risk more than just like how many crimes did you commit? Um, and then also there's all sorts of other dynamic factors that can be considered in tools. It's really easy to put in static factors because you can like have a computer do it instead of asking someone questions. But um, there's um, sort of more psychologist provided tests that can get at like how willing someone is to participate in treatment and things like that. Um, so not everything in a risk assessment tool just has to be like age, criminal history, things like that. Um, and I think my personal opinion is that those things can help um, relying on different types of metrics. And then on the other side, um, more similar to what Kelly was talking about, validating the tool. Um, so when you validate it, you can look at the percent, um, like whether or not the likelihood that someone, like so if someone scoring high is more likely to have actually recidivated than someone scoring low or whatever you're looking at as your outcome. You can also look at type one and type two errors and you can even do that by subgroups. So there can be considerations where you're like, I really care about not having false positives for minority populations. That can be a consideration when validating a tool. Great, thank you. Um... So no other questions have come in for anyone. Um, so I'm going to um, just wrap. Can I ask up. a question? Oh, yeah, please. Yeah, go ahead, Barbara. Okay. Yep, absolutely. All right. So um, I 
I was actually very interested to hear your presentation, Taryn. Um, so a big part of my research in altruism programs has been looking at the firefighting programs from that perspective. Um, so I have a question. I was just giving a back background of why I was interested. Um, but I had a question because I'm not as familiar with the Oregon programs. I'm much more familiar with California and the Cal Fire Partnership, where it's extremely competitive and considered a very valuable position to have. Um, and so with the force, I wanted to differentiate because obviously the forestry activities sound a lot like other work camp where it's required. That's what you have to do. I mean, you hear similar stories with even just doing some of the trash and yard and other work camps throughout like Florida, for example, uh, and OSHA problems. But uh, with the forestry camp in Oregon, do you have to be in the fire program or is that an additional like application, something you have to apply to? Uh, how, do how does that ac actually work? It is something that um, it is it is relatively competitive, and the men who are there mostly want to be there. Some of them talked about how it's not what they were sold <laughs> before they got there. Uh, it's not quite what they expected, and um, of course, there are concerns in addition to safety about the way they're treated when they're out on the grid, and um, that the dignity and shame piece goes into a lot of that and how if they get to the point where they want to leave, they can't just say, this isn't, turns out this isn't for me. Um, so they were getting in trouble on purpose to be shipped out to a different facility, some of them, but others, you know, I don't want to discount the value of the, the certainly potential value of a program like this. Um, the yeah. downside is in Oregon, they still can't work as as firefighters when they get out. Um, in California, that has just yeah, yeah, that's one of the pieces. It's a valuable transition tool, and I think that's a really that's what the thing that took away from the most is you're highlighting a lot of areas where you could have a really potentially powerful program, mm -hmm. but if you don't address these other very serious issues, it really devalues your program. Yeah, exactly, exactly. Thank you. All right. Thank you. Um, so with that, I'm going to uh, wrap this up. Thank you again to all of our presenters. I think I forgot to mention this at the top. Um, this stream was sponsored today by Southern Illinois University Press. Um, please make sure to check out their website um, for all their great scholarship featured there. Um, thanks again to all of our presenters. Thanks to our attendees. Um, I hope CrimCon is going uh, well for you. Um, for those of you who plan sticking around for the 1 p.m. Eastern session, I need to stop this webinar and then reboot it for recording purposes. So um, I will see hopefully some of you uh, in 10 minutes. All right, take care, everybody.